Hello, everyone. This is a recording of a talk that I gave both at the University of Pennsylvania and also the Mathematics Discord server about Tarski's high school algebra problem. So let's get right into it. So the in idea is that Tarski asked if the standard high school identities, that is the rules of simplification that we learn in high school, are sufficient for deriving all valid identities or all valid equations of, say, the positive integers involving addition, exponentiation, and multiplication. So Tarski considered specifically the following 11 identities that he called the high school identities, which we'll call HSI from now on. So basically, the identities uh, of addition, associativity, commutativity, uh, multiplicative identity one, associativity of and commutativity of multiplication, distributivity, and all the standard exponent laws that we learn in middle school or high school. Uh, so we call a structure uh, A with operations plus times exponentiation, which we denote by an upper and one, a HSI algebra, if it satisfies all 11 identities. So what does this mean? So basically A is some set, some collection of elements and plus times and exponentiation are all operations defined on it. A priori, we don't require anything uh, from these operations, but if we want it to be a HSI algebra, which we will in this talk, we require these operations to satisfy all 11 identities. Also, of course, we have to have some distinguished element one, which will act uh, in HSI algebras as the multiplicative identity. Uh, the identities one to six, so those only involving addition and multiplication are also of interest to us. And we will call those the reduced high school identities, which we will denote with this bar here. Uh, during this talk, we will consider the positive integers, which I'm sorry, set theorists, but will only involve uh, numbers, the natural numbers from one and above, which we will denote n. We will consider it both as a HSI algebra with the standard operations and a reduced HSI algebra with just addition and multiplication. Uh, so as an exercise, you can try and prove x plus one squared equals x squared plus two x plus one from the high school identities. And this is a good place to talk about what we actually mean when we say that our a valid identity is derivable from the axioms. So first of all, an identity being valid uh, in the positive integers means that it's some kind of equation with variables. And whenever I substitute any positive integers for those variables, I get a true statement. So for example, x plus one squared equals x squared plus two x plus one is a valid identity. Now, what I mean by deriving it is I mean, we start from the left-hand side and we are able to, using only these 11 rules, these 11 identities, go to the right-hand side. So in this case, we would use maybe uh, law number nine to break this up into x plus one times x plus one, and then we would use distributivity. Uh, so the following question, uh, so the following was known in the mid-1960s when Tarski posed this question. Uh, so the equational theory of n the nat positive integers with addition and multiplication is decidable and axiomatized by the reduced high school identities. So let's break this down. Decidable means that we have an algorithm that can in finite time determine if any equation that you give me is valid in the positive integers. So if you give me any equation involving addition, multiplication, and the number one with how many variables you want, I'll be able to tell you through an algorithm in finite time whether or not that equation is valid. Uh, what it means to be axiomatized by the reduced high school identities is exactly what Tarski asks in his uh, high school algebra problem, only for the reduced high school identities. So basically, if any, so uh, this theorem says that any valid equation using only addition, multiplication, and the constant one can be derived from the reduced high school identities uh, which are the identities one through six here. So the idea of the proof is that for every term, and when we say term, this is just some expression in one addition, multiplication, and any number of variables, uh, uh, associate some polynomial to it and reduce checking uh, and 
reduce checking the validity of inequality to checking inequality of polynomials. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that anymore once we add in exponentiation and things become much harder. Now, it is true that the identities of uh, the natural numbers, the positive integers with addition, multiplication, exponentiation, one is still decidable. So I can still tell you using a finite time algorithm whether any uh, equation involving those is a valid equation. Uh, it is not true that you can derive any such valid equation just from the high school identities. So before seeing why this is true, let's take a detour through some maybe unintuitive models of the high school identities. So before we consider the question of whether or not an identity is derivable, uh, or whether or not an identity not derivable from the high school identities exists, uh, we can think of some alternative models. Now, we usually think of the high school identities as being something that applies to infinite things. So being something that applies to uh, the natural numbers or the integers or the positive integers. But actually, there are a lot of finite models also. Uh, so we can obtain a big family. We actually don't know if it's infinite, but it most likely is. Uh, we can obtain a big family of finite HSI algebras as quotients of n under an equivalence relation. So basically, we define some relation and we take the set of all equivalence classes. Uh, so the relation for some a and k positive integers is so m is congruent mod a k to n if either m and n are less than a then it's just equality or m and n are at least a and then it's just uh, congruence modulo k so this might seem a bit weird at first but we'll see in a few minutes why this modification is actually quite necessary to get a large family of examples uh, so in general this is an equivalence relation and we can get inherited operations on equivalence classes uh, from addition on multiplication, and of course we still have one. So this is always a reduced HSI algebra, but this isn't always a HSI algebra. Now the problem is that exponentiation isn't always well-defined uh, coming from the exponentiation on the positive integers. So when we say, when we mean respecting exponentiation, which is what we need for us to define exponentiation of the quotient and make it a HSI algebra, we mean that if m and n are the same in the same equivalence class, then x to the m and x to the n are also in the same equivalence class. When this holds, we denote the resulting HSI algebra by n sub a k. Now, uh, one can visualize the structure by the following picture. So up until a, we just have a straight line. And, until, and when we get to a, we see some kind of cyclic behavior. So this is very similar if you've ever seen the integers modulo k. Uh, this is basically what's going here, but we introduce this tail. So why do we introduce this tail? The reason is that if we only took the equivalence relation of congruence modulo k, we only get finitely many quotients. In fact, we only get five quotients which respect exponentiation. Uh, and that's not a lot. So to introduce more finite models, we need to introduce this uh, kind of weird equivalence relation. So it's worthwhile noting that this sequence of integers uh, somewhat mysteriously also appears in other places. So shifted by one, it appears as solutions to Sylvester's recurrence relations. Now, as far as I know, it's not exactly clear why this happens, but I think it's worthwhile to note that it does. Uh, so now the question is, okay, uh, are there for a given A, so we saw that for one, there are only five Ks that work. For a given A, are there infinitely many k's that work? So we actually have a criterion to uh, check this. So given some natural number a, we associate a sequence of primes called sigma a by, well, the first prime is two. And if we have the first i primes, so we define this inductively, if we have the first i primes, we multiply all of them, raise it to the power of a. If there is a larger prime, uh, such that pi plus one minus one divides this product, then it is the next in our sequence. So of course this sequence needn't be infinite. Uh, so it can terminate infinitely many steps or it can go on to infinity. So 
uh, the theorem says that there are infinitely many k's for which NAK is a HSI algebra, if and only if sigma A, this sequence of primes, is infinite. But unfortunately, we don't know if it's finite for all A greater than 1. We don't even know if it's finite for infinitely many of them, as far as I'm aware, at least from the sources that I've checked. Uh, so before we move on to the actual uh, solution to the high school algebra problem, let's see some more models of HSI algebras, which don't come from these finite quotients. So first of all, uh, so if you don't understand what these things are, don't really worry about it. These are just some examples uh, for people that understand what this is. But basically a hating algebra is a sort of partially ordered set where the order relation roughly means uh, like A less than or equal to B means that A proves B. Uh, assuming A, we can prove B. And a hating algebra in particular is a place where we can do intuitionistic logic. So it is sort of a place where we can do logic and we have this notion of implication, but uh, we don't have to assume the law of excluded middle. So it's not always that either A or not A is true. Uh, so if we dualize this implication operation, which is this arrow, into uh, this A reverse arrow B is defined to be B arrow A, then we get with these operations that a hating algebra uh, with this modified exponentiation is a HSI algebra. Now, if D is a distributive lattice, again, it's some partially ordered sets with a notion of, of maximums and also greater, uh, greater slower bounds and least upper bounds, then it is a HSI algebra where we define the exponentiation operation as just A to the power of B, we just forget B and we just take A. So you can think of it as the projection onto the first coordinate. Now, if R is a Boolean ring, so it is some ring of structure with addition, multiplication, and so on. Uh, and it's Boolean if every element squares to itself. So x squared equals x for all x. Uh, then again, by defining the exponentiation operation as a to the power of b equals a, we get another HSI algebra. So the constructions discussed in the previous slide give us non-isomorphic. So uh, basically isomorphism here th means that things are basically the same up to relabeling, including how the multiplication works and everything. So it gives us two element HSI algebras on which the operations are not defined the same way. And in fact, there are five such two element HSI algebras up to isomorphism. It is not known if uh, all two element HSI algebras satisfy all of the valid identities of the positive integers, but they do satisfy the counter example called Wilkie's identity, which we're going to discuss now. So Wilkie's identity is this monster. Uh, now I've highlighted here in red what is different between uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, basically, in the exponent, every time we see A, we replace it by a Y, and every time we see Y, we replace it by an uh, Sorry, every time we see X, we replace it by Y, and vice versa. So to prove this identity in the natural numbers, in the positive integers, we can factor this polynomial, 1 minus X plus X squared to the power of XY, out of the second factor on each side. Now, intuitively, the reason why this identity cannot be proven using the high school axioms is that we can't really talk about negation or subtraction in the high school axioms. They're all, you know, uh, everything is just defined with addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. Now, that means that we can't discuss this polynomial, which is very important in this identity, one minus x plus x squared. Although if we add it as an auxiliary operation, in other words, if we allow ourselves uh, a unary operation, so you know, addition is a binary operation, it takes two and puts, brings you back one. A unary operation is just a function. If we allow this function as some operation, uh, then we can prove this identity, but otherwise we cannot. So Wilkie's original proof is, uh, well, other sources call it syntactic. Talking to, uh, after my talk at the University of Pennsylvania, talking to a grad student who was able to track down the original paper, which I was not able to do, and I'll leave a link in the description. The proof itself is not very syntactic, it's actually semantic. Uh, so what Wilkie does basically is he uh, shows that, he shows syntactically that you can 
uh, it suffices to show that the identity is not derivable from less axioms. And then he builds a fairly simple model of those axioms. Uh, basically, he builds some algebra which satisfies those identities, but does not satisfy Wilkie's identity. And of course, if you can build such a model, if you can build a set with operations that satisfies all the high school identities, but not Wilkie's identity, then it means that Wilkie's identity is not provable from the high school identities. Uh, so later, Gurevich actually constructed a model of all the high school identities, which does this uh, with 59 elements. So a model which satisfies the high school identities, but not Wilkie's identity. A few years later, we got down to 15 elements. And as of 2001, using a computer search, uh, aided by a computer search, uh, we're able to get that down to a 12 element model, which satisfies all the high school axioms, but not Wilkie's identity. Uh, and it is conjectured to be the smallest possible such model. So anything with less elements has to satisfy Wilkie's identity and cannot be a capture example. We already know that models with uh, at most six elements have to do this as well. So now we're gonna demonstrate Gurevich's con construction of this, what we call a counter model, a counter example model. So the elements of this model are the natural numbers one through 26, the two sides of Wilkie's identity, which we think of them as formal expressions in some variables, X and Y, uh, which we denote by F for the left-hand side and G for the right-hand side, and the following 31 terms. So we have X, X squared, X cubed, X to the fourth, and Y. So this is a bit confusing, but right now, these are just symbols. X and X squared are not related in any way because we haven't defined the operations here yet. Uh, and we also have all these polynomials and, and powers of X and Y. So the idea is that the operations are defined. So first of all, the high school identities hold, otherwise everything we're doing is futile. But if the expression is on either side of Wilkie's identity, so if, if we think of them as formal expressions, not inside the model, and we evaluate them on the elements X and Y, so again, this is the confusing part. X and Y are also just variables, but they're also elements of our model. And the operations are constructed such that when we evaluate Wilkie's identity on X and Y, the left-hand side becomes the element F, the right-hand side becomes the element G, and those are distinct in our model. So we, we defined it so that Wilkie's identity does not hold. Uh, so again, the idea is that we think of the two sides of Wilkie's identity as distinct elements in our model, and we define this operation so that when we evaluate Wilkie's identity, we get those two sides. This is a little counterintuitive, but it is logically sound, and this gives us a direct proof that the high school algebra problem is impossible. That is, we cannot derive any identity from the high school identities, but we can actually do a little more than that. So first note that if we replace y with a different expression in x that we can't get in our model otherwise, so for example, x to the power of x, then we get a one variable identity that's not derivable from the high school identities by considering the same model. So Gurevich actually proved, inspired by Wilkie's identity, that there is no finite set of identities uh, on the positive integers from which all other identities can be proven. So basically, there is no finite axiomatization of this equational theory of the positive integers with addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. And this is quite a drastic difference from when we only had addition and multiplication, because there, uh, there was a very natural, very small set of identities that proved everything else. Here, no matter how big your set is, you're going to always have an identity that you cannot prove. So. Uh, the idea of the proof is we construct this sequence of identities, which he calls Wilkie type identities. So Fn is equal to th this expression, that's the right left hand side, and Gn is equal to this expression, that's the right hand side, where A is 1 plus x, and Bn, Cn, and Dn are some monic polynomials in x. So for example, Bn is 1 plus x plus x squared, all the way up to x to the n. Uh, and the idea of the proof is will prove that no matter how many identities you have, always there is some m such that fn equals gn is not provable from those identities. So first of all, we need some preliminaries. So denote by t, 
equals underscore hu if t equals u is derivable from the high school identities. So again, that means we start from the left-hand side and then using only the high school identities, we work our way to the right-hand side. In the rest of the proof, we will assume that our set of identities includes the high school identities. Now, the reason we can do this is that if we show that if we add more axioms, we still can't prove everything, then, well, if we take away some identities, obviously we still can't prove everything. So we can just add them in. We do some other reductions that are quite technical and I don't want to get into here, but I'll have all the sources in the description. If you want to see the full proof for yourself, you're welcome to look at the papers and there's some nice expository papers that I uh, also used making this talk. So the key part is we define this numerical invariant, which we call chi of t for each term t. Again, a, a term is just a formal expression in all of our operations, the uh, element one and all of our variables, uh, which is monotonic with respect to subformulas or subterms. So what I mean by this is, for example, uh, Wilkie's identity, this Wilkie type identity is a term, right? It's a formal expression. We allow equality also in our formal expressions. Uh, so for example, A is gonna be a subterm because it appears as like some sub part of the formula or A to the two to the X plus BN to the two to the X is also a subterm or a sub formula. So basically anything that appears as a substring. So you can think of a term as just a string. So anything that appears as a substring is a subformula. Uh, obviously, it needs to be valid with respect to all the operations, but that, I think that goes with that saying. So if uh, so, it's monotonic with respect to subformulas. So if u is a subformula of t, then chi of u is at most chi of t. And we define an order relation, which he calls reductum. So we say t is less than or equal to u means that t is a reductum of u. This is defined directly via this numerical invariant. And it satisfies that if this one equality, u1 equals u2, is less than or equal than this other equality, t1 equals t2, then chi of u1 plus chi of u2 is at most chi of t1 plus chi of t2. So these are the two key facts that we need to know about this invariant chi, which will allow us to prove the theorem. Gorevich then proves that if s is a finite set of valid equalities, and as we assumed before, it includes the high school identities, if fn equals gn, so the nth Wilkie type identity is derivable from s, then there is some uh, identity in s such that fn equals gn is a reductum of t equals u. Now, what I said is not exactly accurate, uh, and the difference here does matter. So let me uh, explain. So there are some a, b, c, and d such that a is provably the same thing from the high school identities as uh, capital A, little b is equivalent, uh, so b equals bn is provable from the high school identities, and so on for c and d, such that f of a, b, c, and d equals g of a, b, c, and d is a reductum of t equals u, uh, where f and g are defined as above. So uh, the reason this matters is because uh, chi, I didn't actually show you the definition, but it's defined directly in terms of how the term looks. So how many variables it has, how many uh, how many addition symbols, how many appearances of the variable x it has, and so on and so forth. So while two things may be, you know, provably equal, they may be, they may look entirely different, and so they will have a different numerical invariant. So the difference here is important because this order relation is defined with respect to this chi. Uh, so in other words, what this, uh, what we're proving here is that if fn equals gn is derivable from s, then there is some t equals u such that f equals g is a reductum of t equals u, and f equals g is provably equivalent to fn equals gn under the high school identities or the high school axioms. So now we can actually prove the theorem. So what we basically do is we take some very, very large number and we choose some n such that some subterm of fn equals gn 
will have a, a, a chi that is too large. So we take mu to be the max of chi of t plus chi of u, where t equals u is in S, and we choose n large enough so that chi of b is greater than u, mu whenever b is provably equivalent from the high school identities to b sub n. So one can show that such a bound exists. For example, chi of little b is greater than three log base three of n. So this is possible. Now, suppose by way of contradiction that for this large n that we chose, fn equal gn is derivable from s. Then we know from the previous slide that f equals g is a reductum of t equals u for some t equals u in s. But here comes the contradiction. So chi of t plus chi of u, by what we know about chi, is at most chi of f plus chi of g. Now, notice that little b is a subformula of f equals g, so this thing is at least chi of b. But now chi of b was specifically chosen to be greater than all of these sums in s, so this is greater than chi of t plus chi of u. So we got here that chi of t plus chi of u is greater than chi of t plus chi of u, and that's a contradiction. So we found some identity of the type fn equals gn for large enough n that is not derivable from s. So this would be the time where if anyone had questions, they are welcome to put them forward. But of course, you're welcome to put the questions in the comments if you've reached so far. Thank you very much for watching. I'll have a list of all the sources that I used, plus Wilkie's original paper, which I did not use while writing this talk, but it is also quite technical and really uh, besides being, you know, the first to do it, it doesn't really add anything to the discourse. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the talk, and I hope you have a great the rest of your day.